In Isaiah chapter 53, our primary verses for the message today will be verses 4 through 6. But I want to begin reading with verse 1 and read through that 6th verse to remind us of some of the things that we noticed last Sunday morning concerning our glorious Lord and how that he was a suffering Lord and Savior for us. Isaiah 53 and 1 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now these verses we used last Sunday morning, pointing out a number of things about our Lord, primarily dealing with how that the messages concerning him over the thousands of years have been refused by the vast majority. Who hath believed our message? Very few people throughout the history of time have really heard the message of Christ. Always a few, a minority of people have been willing to see Christ for who he is and to accept him for the Savior of the world. Now verse, beginning with verse 4, he says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice throughout these verses the statements dealing with we and he. Verses that point out our position and God's position. It can't help but stand out. We esteem him stricken. We're the ones that saw him as smitten of God and afflicted. He was the one who was bruised but for our iniquities. He was the one that was chastised, but it was for our peace that it happened. He was the one who was beaten with many stripes in order that you and I might have peace in the comfort and consolation of God. We're the ones that had gone astray. We're the ones that had turned everyone to his own way. And God put upon him our iniquity. What a statement this is concerning our God and what he has done in behalf of each and every one of us. It shows us how rebellious and sinful man has been. It shows us our basic Adamic nature of going against God and turning our backs upon him. Throughout all of the Bible, the central feature of worship toward God has been the offering of sacrifices. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, one of the first things that God did was to show them how to sacrifice and explain to them, no doubt, the reason for the sacrifices. And from that day until Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, sacrifices and offerings were made to remind people about the Lord and what he would do for them to teach them the need of Christ because sacrifices and offerings were made because of sin, because of man's failures, because of where man could not measure up to God. He had to offer a sacrifice in behalf of his failures. So throughout the Old Testament, these sacrifices and offerings were made and every one of them pointed to Calvary Every single one of them preached a message about Jesus in his suffering, how that he would die and pay the sin debt of the world. Even though 
the Jews were ritualistic and they carried their sacrifices and their offerings time and time and time again to the priests that they might be ordered, offered. It became to them just a, a norm. It became to them just something to do. Their hearts were not in it. They did it more out of obligation instead of their love for God. They did it because they felt like, I have to do it, and not because they were looking to God in repentance and faith. They were simply doing it as a habit and not because of love and concern for God and His cause upon the face of the earth. So, as you and I read these verses, we cannot help but see the Savior, the Son of God, Look in these verses and you can't help but see the cross there with the thorns upon his head. See him as he has been beaten by those wicked men the night before. See his body as it's torn and racked with pain. See him suffering in our place. Suffering because of us. Suffering because you and I were sinners on our roads to torment without God. See Him on the cross there where you and I should have been hanging. Picture the Son of God as He dies for us. There's three primary things in these verses that I want to deal with in this message concerning the smitten Savior. First of all, I want us to see Him as He is stricken. By this I mean, look at the first verse. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Isaiah speaking for himself and all of his people. Said, any kind of illness or disease that came upon any person was looked upon by the people as being God deliberately reaching down and smiting someone. As though the plagues of Pharaoh when they were brought upon, upon Egypt because of their deliberate sin, God had smitten them. This was a simple common belief to them. If you got sick, the first thing they did was they gathered in, what'd you do wrong, old boy? This is why they came to Job like they did. It was a preconceived idea. Job now is sitting there in sackcloth and ashes and it's a preconceived idea that he has committed some grave sin, therefore God has smitten him. That was their common belief. Remember when the man was born blind? The people gathered around and they said, now who sinned, him or his father or his mother? How come he is blind? Somebody sinned. And our Lord spoke and said, no, this man was born blind, not because of his parents' sin or his sin, but that the glory of God might be manifested. Is this man born blind? You see, they had that preconceived idea. Now, when you think of that, and you see Jesus here in our text is being stricken, you keep in mind what those Jews and all were thinking. They were thinking, now this man is a blasphemer. He has claimed to be the Son of God. And we have caught him in his error and in his sin. Now he's nailed to that cross justly. They're saying he ought to be there. He has made this claim and God now is smiting him. And thus they walked around that cross in their victory and in all of their sins and everything as though they were justified in what they had done. It's a sad picture when you really view Calvary in this light that the people there that he had come to seek and to save are walking around saying, man, he's on that cross and he's dying and he ought to be there. How sad. That's what he's talking about when he said we have esteemed him this way. People have the wrong idea and so Isaiah is trying to point out to them, listen, he was stricken. He was smitten of God. He was afflicted. But not because of his sin, but because of our sins. That's why. How many of us have ever come face to face with the fact that yes, we are sinners. It's real easy to see ourselves as pretty good folk, you know, well, I don't go out and do horrible sins and all. Just face it this morning, folk. All of us by nature are exceeding sinners. 
We are. And as good as you may think you are, anything that might come our way, we justly deserve it because we are sinners. And by nature, it's very nature of my being. Whatever God sees fit to bring upon this preacher, he deserves it because I have to pay the price of sin in my body. And bless your heart, whenever God looks upon us, He is looking to see if we have allowed Him to take care of our sin death or if we ourselves are trying to take care of it ourselves. And folk, you can't do it. That's why we've got to look to Calvary. That's why we've got to see Jesus there in our place being stricken, being smitten, being afflicted so that we ourselves might cast ourselves upon the altar and beg God's forgiveness and let Him cleanse us and make us whole. It all goes back to Calvary. Let's look at a second thing here. See this substitutionary death. Verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with His stripes we are healed. Can't you see He's there where we should have been? How can it be made any plainer? All the suffering, all the pain, everything, He is receiving it. For us, He's our substitute. He's there where you and I lawfully, legally, rightfully should have been. Only out of His grace, only out of His love, out of His mercy, is He willing to be there in our place. Only because of His great love for mankind such as you and myself. That's the only reason why that He is there in our place. It's not because we deserved His coming. It's not because He owed us some great debt. It's not because that He's even the Creator and we're the creature. God could have very plainly destroyed man. Cast him into the burning lake of fire forever when he sinned in the Garden of Eden and never looked back and been right and just in doing it. But instead, instead he loved us so much that he was willing to go there and every wound he received in his body that should have been mine, he willingly took it and not once opened his mouth. Not once did he complain. I wish that I could make this as vivid as I have it in my heart this morning. It's as though I was standing right here and Jesus was standing right here. And as they took that old cat of nine tails to hit me with it, that he pushed me out of the way and said, I'll take it myself and let it fall upon him. That's why he did it and he did it for all of us. And every blow that they made to his head with their fists and the palms of their hands and those sticks they had, that he moved me out of the way and stood there and took it for me. That every time they spit, they cleared their throat and went to spit upon me, that Jesus got between me and them. And they spit upon him. All of it for us. All of it because that there was a God in heaven who was willing to be wounded for the transgressions that were ours. He was willing to be bruised for our iniquities. All throughout your Bible, time and again it points out statements that Jesus was sinless. That He had no sin in Him. And yet for our sins... He was stricken and beaten and wounded. For instance, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Look at that. Look at that again. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body. It's as though he reached out to every human being and took every sin they had 
And they were heaped upon him. And then he said, I'll pay the penalty. Whatever these sins demand to be paid, that's what I'll take in my body. Not just for one man. But for the sins of the whole world, He took them all upon Himself as though He were the guilty one and suffered it blow by blow, pain by pain, every step of the way, all by Himself. Remember, no one comforted Him. As He's there, your substitute and mine, no one is standing there willing to help Him and aid Him, even the angelic host of heaven. How many there are, no one knows. They're innumerable. Powerful creatures. Can't you just imagine Gabriel and, and Michael there close by, valiant, powerful. Angels of God and who were willing to do anything that God said they would have done it. But see them as He says, No, I must do it alone. You can't help me. I have to do it myself. All by myself. See His mother as she stands by and others of the relatives that stand off out there. You know Mary's heart went out to Him and she would have gladly gone up there and offered her son some kind of relief, but she could not. See His heavenly Father. Oh, the one that He said, I and my Father are one. And over and over He expounds the love He has for the Father and the Father for Him. Remember the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He said it more than once. Oh, the Father loved Him. And yet there's His Son on that cross. There He is with the guilt and shame of the whole human race heaped upon Him. And the Father can't help His Son. He must turn His back upon Him and let Him die all by Himself. And in Jesus there was the power. Jesus could have said, this is enough. He had the power. He's the Son of God. He's the one that spoke and made the world. Oh yes, He had the power. But still He willingly, gladly, lovingly stayed on that cross until the last moment until he reached that point to where it was everything that had to be done in the flesh. He said, it's finished. And he yielded up the ghost. All for us. All for us. What a penalty was paid that day. Verse 6 points out, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him our lawlessness. We broke the rules. We broke the laws. We're the ones that turned away. We're the ones that said we don't want him. He sought us. He came seeking that which was lost. He came reaching out to us that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He did the seeking. Even today He's seeking. That's right. Just as surely as when He walked upon the face of this earth. Just as surely as that period of time when men handled Him and touched Him and talked to Him face to face. It's just that surely that He's still seeking to save every lost man, woman, boy, and girl. This message of Isaiah 53 is just as real now as it was when He hung on the cross. It's just as real today as it was whenever these words were written down in the New Testament. It's just as real today as it ever was. He died for all. He paid your sin debt Completely. Completely. Now, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Will you also wander away? Will you also turn a deaf ear to His message and, 
and turn away from this Savior who loved you so much? Will you walk out those doors still on your road to eternal torment when there's a God who loved you this much? Who was willing to take every penalty you had upon Himself? Even to the point of taking the sting out of death for you. I mean, He has done everything just because of how much He loved you. And to you today, He offers a complete pardon of all sin. He offers you the privilege to be a son or daughter in the family of God. He offers it to you. I beg of you today, consider Jesus. Consider Him, won't you? Brother Gary, lead us in our invitation. So we have this invitation, I beg of you. Listen to God's Holy Spirit as He speaks to your heart. As He reminds you of all that Jesus did to save you from sin. Listen to it. And as the Holy Spirit shows you your need of repentance because of your sins, that it was because you had sinned that Jesus suffered all of this. Listen to Him. And as He deals with you to confess your sins, to cry out to God to forgive you for Christ's sake, and the Holy Spirit tries to show you to lean upon Jesus, to simply lay everything on Him, trust Him with all of your heart, to rely upon Him as your eternal Savior. Do it. And you can leave here washed white as snow and your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life.